All right. Welcome to the Sports Injury Central Pro Football Doc Podcast. And in honor of the start of the MLB season, we're having our baseball guest be Mr. David Stewart. Dave Stewart, everybody. And uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. You know, Dave, I was thinking about this. I mean, I don't do a lot. I'm not, I'm a bad podcast host in terms of researchers. I just have a conversation, but I was thinking, how do I introduce you? And here's what kind of what I came up with. I don't know of another guy that has done it all in baseball. Like you have, okay. A top player, an MVP type player, a stalwart on many different teams, World Series winner, player, a coach, management, GM, an agent, and now potential team franchise owner. And we'll get to that. Have I covered it all? Am I forgetting something else? Like, is there anyone else who's worn that many hats in baseball? If so, I can't think of any. No, I don't think there are very many people that have gone down those paths. They've done one or the other or a couple or the other, but not all of it. I've, uh, you know, I've been baseball all my life, as you know, and, um, and I love the sport, love being around it. Um, and maybe the reason why I've been around it so long is because I probably can't do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... I think it's unprecedented and maybe not just in baseball to have someone have played, coached, GM, management side, agent. And now, I mean, it's like all facets of, of the game. Uh, it's just funny how things happen because I remember a long time ago having a conversation with the then owner of our Oakland A's team, Walter Haas, and talking about my life after baseball. And Walter made the suggestion that I might want to go into coaching. And I immediately said that I wanted to uh, go into uh, office management and, you know, explained all the reasons why. Um, but along that course, um, you know, with Oakland as the assistant GM with Sandy Alderson and then, uh, you know, working with Kevin Towers in San Diego. Um, it's, it's funny how office management brought me to coaching. Um, you know, Kevin Towers and I, you know, on a trip to Mexico, um, talked me into being the pitching coach there. And it's the first time I'd ever done that. And then leaving there and going to Toronto as the director of player personnel and the assistant GM there, I ended up uh, once again um, being a pitching coach for a short period of time. And then after leaving Toronto, um, I did uh, the pitching coach job in Milwaukee um, as my only position. Um, but, you know, it's just funny how the paths have led me in different ways and in different different um, outlets in, in, in the sport. No, no, no question. And then including GM of the Diamondbacks, et cetera. So let's talk first. Let's go in chronological order, pitching your pitching career. Um, what does your pitching quote tombstone say? <laughs> well, that's the first time I've ever been asked that question. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to say tombstone, but you get what I'm saying. What do you remember for? What, what, you, what does it say, your pitching career? You know, um, I would say that my career was um, a, a career that um, basically I made the I made the most out of everything that I that I had every God gifted talent that I had I made the most of it. Um, you know I, I I will always say this and you know people argue it but you know I wasn't the best guy doing that job when it came to talent. Um, but I worked hard at it. Um, I became a student of, of my position. I talked to anybody and everybody I could to learn. And it started with Roy Campanella and, and uh, Don Newcomb and, you know, my teammates, Don Sutton, Bert Hooten. 
you know, Big Jim Bibby, Bibby when I was with the Texas Rangers. I had an opportunity to play with Steve Carlton in Philadelphia. And then eventually um, I was able to put all of that stuff together. You know, Sandy Koufax was also a, a big piece of everything that I did. And then I was able to, you know, do it on my own. And, and then I ran into probably the finishing piece of my career, which was Dave Duncan and meeting him, having the opportunity to talk to him. And I think this is a missing factor even in baseball today is that most don't talk about the mental portion of baseball and how to prepare, um, visualizing and being able to give yourself the best opportunity in any situation that could possibly happen on the field. And he was good with that. And he was great in helping me with that. And um, he was a big factor for me. And so, like I said, I was a guy that wasn't the most talented guy. I didn't have the fastest fastball, at least in my prime. I didn't. Um, and um, I didn't have the best breaking ball in my prime. But I learned how to use all those things uh, along with, you know, honing my skill when it came to command of the strike zone, both sides of the plate. And, and um, you know, I had, a, I had a really, really good career. Well, Dave, I don't know if I should be proud that it was the first time that you've been asked that question or is it maybe it's just a very bad question. But I didn't know the answer to my own question. But as you're talking, if I were trying to describe you, I might say, because tombstones are quote short, the the most feared pitcher of his time. I mean, and uh, I say that in many ways, besides being, you know, a, a great pitcher, feared for what you can throw and do, but batters were afraid of you, right? The, the <laughs> scowl, the, and, and look, I know you as this really nice guy, but Tell me about that dichotomy of being a very feared pitcher and part of the whole game. You know, um, a name that I left off the list of mentors and people who were very influential uh, in my pitching career, you know, was Bob Gibson. Um, but when I was a kid growing up in the Bay Area, you know, I watched Marin Shell and I watched – Don Drysdale and Bob Gibson was 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 a was a part of that group of what I called the intimidators in that period of baseball. Uh, Bob Gibson would would put you in the dirt for looking at him funny, and Don Drysdale dominated the San Francisco Giants because he took the heart out of the middle of their order, which was McCovey Mays. And when you take those guys out of the lineup because you just constantly pound those guys inside or they're having to think about is the next pitch going to be at my head? You know, it, 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 it's, it's an intimidating factor. Now in 16 years of pitching, I never hit a player in the head. Um, but I wasn't afraid to hit a player in the back or in the leg or in parts that would make them think ribs, you know, make them think that, you know, this is not a guy that I want to dig in on and the opposing pitcher and people don't think about this factor. If you hit one of my guys, I'm going to hit one of your guys. And if you hit my third hitter, I'm going to hit your third hitter, you hit my fourth hitter. I'm going to hit your fourth hitter. And I might hit two in a row. And so when you think about that factor, you know, it also keeps the game on a, on a nice, even playing field. And if you have, a good offensive team like the guys I played with, and they now have a much, much more comfortable at bat, then it, you know, it puts me in a position to win games. But it also serves as a factor that, you know, I'm an X factor for my guys, and your guys need to worry about it because you don't get away with it. If you do, you might pay twice. Uh, that's an interesting point, but I, I totally uh, see that uh, point there. Now, you said in 16 years, you've never hit a guy in the head. In 16 years of pitching, did you ever hit anyone on accident and it was just wild? 
you know, Bob Gibson taught me something. <laughs> and um and I have to say it's it's one of the best things that I've 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 ever heard when I asked him. I asked the same question you just asked me. And the his answer was anytime I hit someone, I did it because I meant to do it. And I would have to say, anytime I hit someone, it was because I meant to do it. And I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the proper context. When Bob Gibson did it, I'll, you know, it was all about intimidation for him, making sure that he had the best possible day he could on the mound. For me, sometimes there was a guy that I just didn't like. I didn't like how he stepped in the box. You know, I didn't like the reputation of the guy. I'd hit him. Other times, if I was asked by my manager to protect one of my teammates, then I have to hit a guy. So when I hit a guy, it was it was intended to be that way. Okay. I, I mean, I remember you telling me that many years ago on a golf course, and I found that unbelievable. But I believe you. You said it so matter-of-factly. Uh, when you intended to hit someone, did you ever miss him? Julio Franco, as when I think back to it, might have been the only guy I intended to hit, and I missed him. And I'll tell you what happened in that case. Julio knew it was coming. Um, I was entering a game. There were back-to-back -back home runs hit off of the pitchers before me. And so Julio was the next hitter. He was the first hitter I would face. And it's customary when you have back-to-back -back home runs, somebody's got to pay. So Julio knew it was coming. So I was in my delivery getting ready to make the pitch. I threw it where Julio was supposed to be if he just turned away like most hitters do. What Julio did was he stepped across home plate <laughs> to, the left, to the batter's box where the left-handers hit. So I missed him. <laughs> so one guy was good at dodgeball but otherwise you you hit everyone you meant to hit and uh, and so forth now let's lead to the next time. so my tombstone for, pitching tombstone for you isn't bad most feared pitcher at, at the time right that's not too bad okay, we'll take that one all right it's it's quick and succinct so you mentioned it was expected that you'd hit a guy after two straight home runs is it that way anymore? I, I see the game has changed a ton, right? Uh, there aren't pitchers like you that pitch the same innings. It's like you go five innings, that's a good run for a starter, and you got the seventh inning guy, eighth inning guy, ninth inning guy. You got five-man plus rotations and so forth. The game's changed a lot. As it, Are you still – is it still a rule to hit a guy after two home runs? And, and explain how the game has changed for pitchers and – Perhaps your thoughts on why, because it has changed quite a bit. Well, you know, the game has changed. The umpires are a little bit more cognizant of the hitters and are more protective of the hitters. But at the same time, pitchers don't utilize the inside part of the plate on hitters anymore. Um, they're taught to um, be extremely down and away. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's an art to pitching inside on hitters. Um, and I learned how to pitch on the plate and off the plate. And hitter and pitchers today, they don't know how to do that. Um, I think when the thought of pitching inside on hitters today makes pitchers nervous, and when they get nervous, two things happen. They lose velocity, but they also lose control. And then that creates a lot of situations where hitters are getting hit. And I believe that that's why MLB, um, they decided that um, they would do a better job of protecting hitters. So, you know, on a pitch that's really meant to be a purpose pitch now, you can get a warning mm. versus back in the day, 
mean, you can knock a guy down. You might even be able to knock a guy down twice and then get a warning. Um, and so I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that pitchers don't know how to pitch inside anymore. And because of that, umpires have to protect hitters. Mm. What about the number of pitches and the and the rotations and the like it's not the same that that it used to be. Why is that? Why is it the money? Is it health concerns? Is it the high velocity of pitchers now in terms of stress on the body? Why are pitchers not the same anymore in terms of the number of innings and the and the amount they, they can throw? Well, you know, that directly points to the fact that people are thinking mentally people think that velocities are higher than they've ever been and they're not. Mm. Um, but it's being taught to kids now throw as hard as you can for as long as you can. Mm. And more focus is on strikeouts than getting hitters out. So when you're trying to strike people out, it produces a lot of three ball counts it produces a lot of pitches in a five inning period of time. Pitch counts are now at a hundred pitches. So if you throw a hundred pitches in five innings, you're done. We had a, a, what we, I guess what we would call a mental pitch pitch count in my time, but that number wasn't one, 100. It was closer to 120, 130. But we were also taught to use, great assortment of pitches. We were taught to use two seam. We were taught to use inside part of the plate, outside part of the breaking ball. And more importantly, we were taught to not fear contact. Um, and that means you're trying to get hitters to put the ball in play. If you watch batting practice and they're taking easy batting practice, you'll see that there are more outs than there are hits, even in back to batting practice with balls that are right in the middle of the plate. And so we were taught to just pitch for outs, pitch to contact. These kids are today are, are, are taught to pitch for strikeouts. And that's why the pitch counts are high, and that's why the innings are reducing for starting pitchers. Oh, that's interesting. And well, my, my son's 11. You know, everyone's telling him all this stuff. I tell him, first pitch strike, pretend you only have two balls, never go to – Try not to go to three balls. Don't walk anybody. Pitch to contact. You're, you're going to get your outs uh, kind of deal. Yeah. But that's my very non-scientific approach. He wants to do all sorts of things. His pitching coach, who's awesome, like will give him a hard time if he throws a ball belt high over the middle of the plate. It's like you got to hit corners and good pitches off the plate. And so that's kind of what you're saying. But I, I tell my son, look, if you're behind on the count, and you're pitching to the number 10 hitter, everyone bats in rec league, it's okay to groove one over the middle of the plate. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Make yeah. sure you're going to get that strike call. The number uh, 10 guys hitting 10 for a reason. <laughs> and it's rec league. So, you know, there's a difference uh, there, uh, et cetera. The last thing you want to do is walk the number 10 hitter. Um, to the interest of time, I want to talk a little bit about, I don't know how much you can share. You're involved in, an ownership group and expansion in Nashville. A, how's that going? B, balance that with your thoughts about the A's and what's happening to the Oakland A's slash Las Vegas A's. Uh, your take on this, since you have all this different perspective. You know, I, I, I try to stay clear of the A's situation um, um, because you and I have a long friendship you know, I'll talk a little bit about it because I have been not intimately involved in it, but because I'm from the Bay Area, I broadcast for NBC A's, the A's broadcast station. You know, I hear a lot, I see a lot and have a lot of conversations. Um, you know, when you look at today's Oakland A's team and you think, wow, they're going to Las Vegas, first thing you think is, well, couldn't they have found a solution to stay in the Bay Area? This situation has been going on for a long time. The, the A's in general, not just this ownership group, but ownership groups before, probably dating after the Haas family, which is the ownership group that I played for. So let's take this back to probably 1995, 
which is my last year. Walter Haas passed. He sold the team, I believe, in 90, 96 or 97. So if you go all the way back to 97, the A's franchise has looked to find a new facility, to play in a new facility. The Raiders shared um, the Coliseum with the A's. And as you know, the Raiders left the A's and moved to Los Angeles. And when they came back, they built a monstrosity in uh, the outfield that changed the dynamics of, of how the game of baseball is played in the Coliseum. But all of this was done for a team who had left Oakland to only come back to Oakland. And so at some point, eventually, as we all know, the Raiders eventually moved to Las Vegas. In the meantime, the A's had been, over the years, asking for improvements to the stadium that they are playing in currently, but always keeping an eye on an opportunity to move into a new facility someplace in the Bay Area. So they looked at Fremont. At one point, they looked at San Jose. They looked at different places in the downtown Oakland area and eventually settled on Howard Terminal. Um, like with all franchises, baseball and football franchises, you count on the city for some type of funding uh, through a bond, infrastructure, land something. And that's what happened with the A's. The current administration, um, council, council people, and the mayor who was with the council, the city council, they were all against the Oakland A's building a stadium at Howard Terminal, which is downtown in an area uh, 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 by Jack Lennon Square. And they were trying to force the A's to stay in East Oakland at the Coliseum. Me personally, if I owned the team, I'd leave them at the Coliseum, build a stadium while we still continue to, to play in the old stadium. And I think that works because you've got BART, you've got Amtrak, you've got um, the freeways and you've got uh, transit that that surrounds that area. So it's good in and out. But the owner felt that they wanted to do something different. They took a look at what the Giants had done in San Francisco and they said, hey, this is going to be the right place for us to do something similar to what the Giants have done. And it should be able to create revenue for the city of Oakland. It was a $12 billion development that the city drug their feet on. And, you know, there was pressure being put to the A's by the commissioner's office to, to make a decision to do something. And it just got to a point where when the city finally decided to engage in helping with the funding for the new stadium, the A's had already made a decision to move to Las Vegas, Nevada. And that's, pretty much what happened to it. Um, it was a bad marriage, uh, in my opinion, from the start. You've got people at the city council that didn't want it. And then when they started to feel the pressure of three franchises leaving the city of Oakland, the Raiders, the Warriors, and the A's, then they decided to get involved, and it was just too late. Mm. Well, that's a interesting, reasonable take. When you're tried for 25, 30 years, that, that is a, a long time. How's Nashville coming along? Nashville is coming along great, um, having, you know, ongoing conversations with the commissioner's office about the do's and don'ts and what we need to do and what to expect. Um, Baseball is not going to be played. Um, I can't see before 2029. Um, we've got a basic, uh, we've got a CBA that's coming up, the basic agreement with the players and management. It's coming up at the end of 26. And you have to really see what, what's going to happen with that. Is there going to be a strike? Is there going to be a lockout? Um, what's going to come from that? And once that's settled, um, baseball will move forward to expansion. Um, we've done a lot of work in Nashville. Um, we're doing some great things there, getting involved in the community. It's a great city, um, both tourism, the culture there, the music, the just it's just one of the fastest growing cities in America. Um, on top of that. And so we think it's going to be a great opportunity. Um, players want to play there. I think that, and I can't speak for the commissioner, but 
I believe that Major League Baseball wants to come there. And, you know, we're in a good position to make that happen. Sounds good. All right. So as baseball season starts, uh, Chris Young and, and you know, uh, got a World Series for the Rangers. Certainly, I think, a surprise to a lot of people, right? And uh, brought Bruce Bochy out of retirement, the whole deal. Who do you see as a surprise team that will contend or potentially win a World Series this year? You know, I'm always going to – you always have to look at the Braves, but they're not a surprise. Um, but you always have to look at the Braves. They've got some of the most talented players in baseball. Um, you know, Acuna is going to be – well, he's MVP this year, and I expect him to win many more after this year. Um, they're young. And um, you know, now they're experienced in, in, in the playoffs. So you always have to look at the Braves. Um, if you look at other teams that are out there, you know, not because they're in the Bay Area, but, you know, I, I give a lot of credit and a lot of credence to Bob Melvin. Um, I looked at their team uh, this spring training, at least their lineup. Um, and, you know, I like the group of offensive players that they have. And I think that they've they've done enough to be on top of this. I mean, you've got Logan Webb leading your starting rotation, um, which you've got to love him as, as one of your top guys. You know, and then you, you add Blake Snell. I think, you know, pitching in, 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 in that ballpark is perfect for Blake Snell and the type of pitcher he is. Um, this guy's won two Cy Youngs. And so, you know, I, I believe that pitching is going to be the determining factor for anybody that gets in it. Um, and so you, you've got you've to look at the Giants. And you know what? The Padres, for all of the years that pe keep, people keep saying they're the team, I believe that this year, because not very many people are saying they're the team, is the year you're going to have to watch out for him. A.J. Preller works hard at, at his job as, as the, the director of, of that organization, trying to put them in the right place. Yeah, I like Mike Schilt as the manager. I think that he's focused. He's prepared strategically. I think he's one of the better guys at it. Uh, I have no idea why St. Louis fired him, um, but I, I think that you, you've got to look at the Padres. I don't think anything's going to come from the central um, in the, in the national league central. Um, it, it's going to be tough to determine what happens in the East. Quite frankly, um, I don't think the Mets are the team that you've got to look at, you know, the Marlins could surprise you. They've got good young talent and they've got great pitching. I love their pitching coach, uh, Mel Stottlemyre jr. And then when you look at the AL, I mean, you can't discount Texas and Bruce Bochy. And you said you were surprised by it. I was not. I, I mm. thought as soon as they hired Bruce Bochy, that made them an immediate favorite for me. I, I thought that put them in great position to, uh, to, to get to the postseason. And if they get to the postseason, of course, you know anything can happen. You know, <laughs> once again, the, the, American League, uh, the, the American League Central, I don't think anything's going to come from there. And, um, you know, you, you keep talking about the Yankees. Um, I, I think that the Yankees might have an opportunity this year, and you always have to be aware of the Toronto Blue Jays because they're a young, good team. Well, that's, that's why uh, you're the expert. I'm surprised by the Texas Rangers. I like your list. I'm a little worried about Acuna and his meniscus issues. Of course, we do injury takes. I'm a little worried about Judge and his toe and and then uh, compensation injuries and obviously the pitching for the Yankees. All right. You probably have to run. You've already run overtime. One final question for you. Give us your take on this Otani situation. Ooh, boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, when you ask yourself... The, the, the common sense questions, which are, I mean, who gives anybody access to an account with that kind of money in it? You know, that, that's one of the questions you ask yourself. And then the other question you ask yourself is, 
you know, these bookies, they don't extend those type of lines of those types of lines of credit to people who don't have money. And I'm not too sure an interpreter has stacked that much cash that they're going to extend on that kind of credit. Um, but, you know, um, when you look at when you look at Otani externally <clears throat> and you hear the things that are said by him, um, uh, that are said about him, you have to think that, you know, there's there's something to the fact that this kid may have may have done this, may have may have. I don't know that it's a crime, but well, I guess they're saying it's a crime that he may be he may be the person that's that's done all of this. And so, you know, there's an investigation that's going on. Uh, both by MLB and now you've got a federal investigation, um, and I think that you, that, that, that whatever it is, it's going to come out um, pretty goddamn soon, sooner than later. I, I think this that um, because no suspensions have been been placed on Otani, that um, that's a good sign. Um, but, you know, I think we're all just going to have to wait and see. A lot of stuff doesn't make sense, and I'm not trying to read into it. Um, but when you, you know, when you, when you look at it and you say, hey, you know, this doesn't make sense, then all you can really do if you're in a position like yours and mine is just to wait, sit back, and see what comes from it. I hope, you know, that that – Otani is not found of, of any wrongdoing um, because he's, in my opinion, one of the best things for baseball today. Yeah, well, look, I think the, the weird thing is that although gambling is now legal in 40 states, it's not legal in California. That's the, the rub and the problem. And what we do at Sports Injury Central People argue there's a lot to do with gambling and, and so forth, but I make it a point not to ever place any wagers, including offshore accounts or anything, because I don't want to ever be a target for any of this. Why put yourself in the in the crosshairs? And that may be something that's escaped escaped Atani and his translator. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but there's a lot of confusion. The story changed. That always gets people worried. Yeah. Look, I, I I hope he's clean of all this, but. The only thing that I would have to say is people tell me that in theory, I don't know this is fact, I'm not a legal scholar, that nobody's ever been prosecuted for placing a wager. Of course, baseball's suspended people and whatever, but I mean prosecuted by the government for placing a wager. They always go after the bookies and what have you. But is there an exception in this case because it's so high profile? I don't know. And obviously the potential wiring of money is a little bit aiding and betting, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's so many different layers of this. I just hope it all works out for baseball yeah. and Otani and, and what's right is right there, but uh, a lot of different layers to it. I, I will say this though. I could see how uh, it's a lot of money, but you know, especially when you throw in the language barrier, you know, I don't know how many times I end up docu signing things and, you know, obviously I have no language barrier and it's 18 pages and I docu sign and uh and what have you I, I i don't know but there's a lot of layers to to unpeel here all right dave thank you so much for your time i know you got to go anything else that you want to say or bush no, no, or no. anything else no no doc i'm sorry i missed you when you were here in arizona but I'm looking forward to seeing you soon all good my friend uh all right i'm gonna push that idea of the pitching tombstone the most feared picture <laughs> of his time i think it's a good one and i look at it this way you're right the way that things are being adjudicated now and umpires I don't think there's going to be another Dave Stewart out there because I don't think you're prevented from from going down <laughs> that path now nowadays. So yeah. that'll be your that, that that I'm going to try and make that stick. Of course, I have no power to make it stick, but let's right. see if it sticks. <laughs> no, no, All right, thank you, uh, Dave Stewart. Thanks everybody, and we'll uh, take a break here, and then we'll continue with part two of the Sports Injury Central Pro Football Doc Podcast. Thank All you. right, thanks to Dave Stewart, and. Uh, Part two here, lots to talk about. I was interested. You're the big Oakland A's guy. I've never heard anyone call him David Stewart. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, he saw the David Chow wanted to go David Stewart. 
Is he? Did he request that? He he puts it in. He doesn't. He types it. Oh, he types it in. I thought you did that. No. Okay. I I would have wrote smoke. I, I, it shows you my technical abilities. I would have asked him, <laughs> do you prefer David all this time? Because everyone says Dave Stewart. I yeah. should, I missed. Was it, was my tombstone question bad? It felt, no, it felt I like you it's died. His pitching yeah. tombstone, yeah, right? Yeah. I no, mean, still, like, what you're just looking for something short to sum up his career. I, I, yeah. I get the, you weren't declaring him uh, on the far end no, of it. He's still got a lot to do. He's, he's looking saying? ahead to 2029 in Nashville. So, well, the other thing that I, that I forgot on his list is that, I've, you know, all the things he did, he was also a broadcaster. Yeah. So, name someone else who's done. I mean, yeah. the only thing he hasn't been is the equipment manager or the athletic <laughs> trainer, right? I mean, he's done everything in the sport. Yeah, it's right? incredible. So, in Google, if you type in David Stewart, he's non existent. So, you have to type in Dave Stewart to actually find him. Yeah, so well, yeah. see, see, that's why I'm a bad interviewer, man. I missed that <laughs> obvious point. Dave's David. Did we get into this all wrong? Should we be saying David the whole time? I, I thought it was you, so I didn't. I let it go. <laughs> all right, where are we going? Second half here. Lots of different things. Obviously, March Madness. Yeah, been pretty good. You know, uh, this is the first year we've gone super duper heavy into right. March Madness analysis of injuries, and it's been pretty good, right? You all using the algorithms are what plus eighteen? Yeah, I want to shout out because a special week. Sign up uh, for college basketball picks. Obviously, Sweet Sixteen still left, and you get our MLB futures this week because baseball is kicking off on Thursday. So get uh, at least ten selections. Taylor's uh, whittling them down, but he's going to have at least ten for plus MLB. eighteen. Holy smokes! Yeah, that's a pretty good busy well, little weekend. First year that we had a six score for at least the top thirty six teams. We've never done that. Before. Obviously yeah, value out of that, right? all based on the algorithm. That's what it spit out. Obviously, the player pops got a little bit more specific and more uh, on individual injuries. Braden and and where I think is good is is because the NFL there's so much injury information, and in basketball, especially college, yeah, much less information. And each injury is a cluster, right? right. Four and a half because it's five starters versus 22 starters in the NFL or in football. So I think that's where some of it comes from, but, but good job. I'll stick to the injury analysis. You guys <laughs> stick to what you do there, but March madness is, uh, is, uh, is fun. San Diego state sweet 16 again. Yeah. We'll take it. Is it wrong of me? Cause I don't think San Diego state is as good as they were last year. Well, they're minus 10 and a half, or plus 10 and a half this year. So where, where, uh, where's the final four at? this year i don't even know that's a good question taylor's gonna find out am i being a bad fan we watched the game last night i'm a big brian dutcher fan i really wanted yeah. them to beat even though i used to claim all of ivy leagues right? right i was definitely rooting against yale and san diego state won pretty easily i'd love for them to beat uconn right revenge game yeah. and so forth but there's a part of me where i'm like do i really want them to get to the final four because <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, it's not as far, five. but that's an expensive ticket. I took my son last year. Yeah. San Diego State makes it again. Now it's going to be the. Yeah, I, 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 look, it's I don't think they're going to win it all this year. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought they had it, you know, a, a snowball's chance yeah. last year. So uh, went down to Houston. So uh, maybe I'm a bad fan to, to sort of seek and say, okay, beat UConn, get in the elite eight, and then maybe stub your toe, <laughs> <laughs> threading the needle there, but great job with them there. Might have to settle for Kishaw Johnson on Arizona, making it all the way be a home game for them in Glendale. If they make the final four. Yeah. We'll have we done a follow up on your son? I know last year he, he did. The oh, that's right. Bracket <laughs> he, I did see on he has a better plot this year. You could argue. Oh, he, all right. I don't know. <laughs> You could put up Twitter pictures. So last year I put up throwback Thursday on Thursday morning saying he was sick. He was yeah. like no shirt on, you know, in a blanket, but with his computer open, eating his ice cream and his bracket. You could see his bracket there. So he was sick in the morning last year on Thursday. And the wife took the other kids to school. She came back and found him on the couch like that, posted up with, with all the stuff. And this year he went to school. And I was like, oh, so I tweeted that picture. I think you forgot this year. Well, he gets to school at eight o'clock. By 8 30, wife gets a phone call that he's in the nurse's office. <laughs> By nine o'clock, she's down there picking him up. By 9 30, he makes first tip. <laughs> I was gonna say nine, his first tip is yeah, 9 30. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> so 
what undoubtedly happened, his teacher is pretty cool, fifth grade teacher. He probably <laughs> said something about March Madness or one of the kids. Yeah. And he went, wait a minute. <laughs> kind of, I did have a patient on last Wednesday did his knee surgery. And I think he was pretty happy that he could be off work Thursday and Friday yeah. and be at home to to watch what was going on. <laughs> now, he swears he didn't plan it that way, right. but... You know, his wife might have been sitting there. <laughs> I don't know. We alluded to that last podcast. Yeah, right? yeah. So my my son, he did it again. He yeah. he was there, and and I. The interesting thing is, I had a follow up picture from the wife where by ten o'clock he was on the couch, like cheering, like <laughs> yeah. this, like he was clearly <laughs> fine. And I put out a poll saying, should I send him back to school, leave it alone, or cancel patients to join him? <laughs> and the winner was 55% cancel patients to join. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did not cancel. Yeah, patients. they don't know how scheduling Article works. <laughs> I did not cancel patients. <laughs> Anyways, uh, NFL news. Yeah, big news out of the uh, owners meeting that the hip drop tackle has been banned. Although I don't know what, uh, how do you ban specifically the hip drop tackle? Is there bigger news? Question, honest question. Yeah. Banning the swivel hip drop tackle or the NFL coach's picture being released. Oh, that happens every year. So the swivel drip, swivel hip drop tackle, tough to say. It's like negative news. Yeah. Negative news is all that. Positive news is all the picture. Those all right. Pretty good right now. So here's my thing. We've been saying for a long time since Kendall Drake with the right. Raiders. Kenny Drake, Kenny, right? Ken, Kendall. Kenyon Drake. <laughs> Broke his ankle with the Raiders, and he complained mm -hmm. about that tackle. Uh, to obviously Tony, Tony Pollard, Pollard yep. to Mark Andrews. Mm -hmm. Been saying for a long time, the hip drop tackle is as or more dangerous as the horse collar tackle. Right. And no one's worried about the horse collar tackle being illegal. Now, I get the adjudication side. I get all the comments, J.J. Watt, you name it, flag football, the whole deal. This is an interesting thing here. Yeah, the league is looking at safety here, and it is a dangerous play. So I have to applaud them. They went against the Players Association. But if you read between the comments of some league official, it's really interesting. They don't want the penalty called unless all three elements, wrapping with both arms, swinging your body unweighted, and landing on the back of people's right. legs. Only if those three clear elements are there do they want the penalty called. But if they're not clearly there, they don't want the penalty called. They don't want to affect the game. But they reserve the right to go fine people yeah. on Monday. And they're That's basically saying they're trying to get, just like they got head hits out of the game, plenty of times it wasn't called in real time. But then they went ahead and find people and eventually retrain people. So uh, that seems to be the path that they're down. Good, bad, indifferent. I, I think it's good for injuries. I get the argument. But here's my thing on this. Do people now circumvent this by grabbing on, swinging, and letting go with one hand? You're right. still going to bring them down. And I would argue there's still the same still danger. Slightly dangerous, yeah. Same, same danger, but as you're about to land on the legs, you let go with one arm yeah. or both arms right. or just one arm. One arm. One, the one arm, usually when you grab someone around the waist, one arm is the predominant arm. Right. Yeah. One's just yeah. you know trying to hang on too. Do you take that other arm off? And now does, does that take away the penalty? I, I don't know. we got to ask. Dean Blandino. Yeah. I, I don't know that they know how to, they're going to officiate it yet. Yeah. And there's an interesting point. You can't, it's hard to practice officiating this. Yeah. Because it only happens in games. It doesn't happen in practice. I can't imagine the speed of it, all the refs trying to see that too. And it makes sense that they're saying, oh, don't throw the flag unless it's clear and obvious. But they want the, the right to go back on replay and see which players are doing it most or and here yeah. comes the fines here right comes the fines exactly so I, I i get all sides of this of the nfl trying to do the right thing for safety right. i get why the players association doesn't like it uh, i don't know how they're going to adjudicate if you let go with one hand and it's just now one hand yeah. as you land I, I i don't know there's alterations i mean i'm sure the players association saying how do you want me to tackle derrick henry <laughs> like there's no way to bring this guy down if it's not with all my body weight well it's going to be interesting they said the hip drop tackled happened 
about almost one time per game. Mm -hmm. So does that one time, if you can't tackle that way, or if it's called, leads to one additional first down? Does right. that affect totals and other things? I, I don't I know. Would, I would think it question. benefits the offense a little bit. Now, I, there's part of it, too, that scoring's been down. Yeah. So, you know, the league likes scoring. So, yeah. So, anyways, hip drop tackle is something that we will have to deal with. So, what about part two of the news? The 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 coaches. Uh, yeah. We got to pick out our beast of the week on the coach's picture. Well, I'm looking at the coach's picture now. And look. Well, I have one comment, though. Why, why couldn't we get them all together at once? Like, or are they all doing meetings? Like, what's going on? Because you, you had the list of who's out of it. Who's out of it? Get them all out there, right? Yeah, there's missing five, five, yeah. five. Okay, let's let's take a poll. Okay, just a, among us. First of all, full disclosure: I love Big Cat. I love his thing. I will read his assessment of this coach's picture. I have not read it, so there will be no copycat ideas. All the lame ideas will be mine, etc. I have not read or looked at it. I haven't really studied this picture that much. So, who are the five that are missing? Give me them one at a time. Mike Tomlin's one. Right. Okay. Purposeful or accident? Uh, I think it's pur purposeful. Okay. <laughs> Next one. Uh, Nick Sirianni. Purposeful or absent or, or accident? Purposeful. I think what? he's trying to be Belichick. Because Belichick is a, he's one that always misses a lot. <laughs> there needed need to be a new Belichick of who misses it every year. My vote, Tomlin's purposeful probably. He's like, purposeful. why do I need to yeah. do this? Yeah. Nick Sirianni? <sighs> He kind of beats to his own drum. That might have just been an accident. He, he had something else. That, something. He, he he might have had something else to do. I mean, or like forgot about it. Nick Sirianni beats his own drum. Here's the next one. Sean Payton. Couldn't be any more purposeful for me. Uh, <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. How about Ryan Clark's comments? I did not see those, yeah. That he mistreated Russell Wilson. I might be misquoting him. Like uh, he's mourning the death of a love or something like that death of like basically he's saying he was nice to drew Brees, but he wasn't nice to russell wilson mm -hmm. russell wilson wasn't his guy yeah. <laughs> he inherited russell wilson for a year and he had to deal with him drew Brees was his hand-picked guy that he developed and, and had a ton of success with you cannot make that right. comparison a man still mourning his lover, yeah. a man still yeah. mourning his lover is what ryan <laughs> clark said i mean but you would you okay, but you but he was never in love with Russell Wilson, is my point of view. He inherited Russell Wilson. Uh, Drew Brees was his hand-picked oh, yeah. guy that he, you know, anyways. So Sean Payton, purposeful. Who else? Mike McCarthy. What do you think? Purposeful. Um, I would say I do, that. I'd say I said I don't know. He just did what Jerry told him to do. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Jerry, do I go Jerry, in the picture or not? I'm joking. <laughs> joking. And then the Bears, uh, Matt Everfield. I feel like he has a lot going on. Yeah. Like, picked, he's to he's probably running around some... doing a bunch of stuff. So, Or maybe this is a picture of people that will actually start the season. Is it? No, just joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> joking. Yeah. Hot joking. Seat. Hot seat without joking. any games played. Joking. Joking. Right. joking. He's in, okay. He's in, he's in the all right, I'll ask a serious question. My first serious question here is, I get the attire is picked by the coaches and whatever they yeah. are. How's the seating arrangement done or standing arrangement? It's not alphabetical. Yeah, it's it's kind of random. It just come on in. Yeah. I don't think uh, Kyle Shanahan was happy to be next to Antonio Pierce because Antonio Pierce looks like he could break him in half if he wanted to. Well, what I will say that if you go through real quickly, Kyle Shanahan's a lot taller than I thought he was. Yeah, he was. He's, he's, he's height for height with Antonio Pierce, yeah. but Antonio Pierce probably got 80 pounds of muscle on him. <laughs> no doubt. 80 no, pounds no, of something. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> 80 pounds of, <laughs> of one thing and 80 pounds of another, but that's a whole other story. No, it's interesting. There's no alphabetical, but in the bottom row, you got McDaniel and McDonald next to each other, right? And they did that on purpose. Next to each other, which you would assume, right? Well, they're just talking to each other. Okay, so my first takeaway. Okay, everyone says Andy Reid in his Hawaiian shirt. Everyone knows that's Reed. it's fine. Yeah. Um, how about some? Uh, Dennis Allen came straight from the golf course, or is going to the golf course. That's for sure. Dennis Allen. Yeah, that looks like it. But but Andy Reid needs to you know get in the tanning bed or some <laughs> lotion <laughs> like, on those it, legs. Like, so it, it, wise, yeah. You know. <laughs> um, the other thing I'd say about Jim Harbaugh, my boy Jim. Okay. Yeah, John Harbaugh's shirt looks a little too pressed there. Yeah. But Jim, what happened to the khakis? Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. He's he's zigged. He's got the San Diego Charger blue. 
Uh, yeah, that's. But what happened to the khakis? Isn't he always Mister Khakis? Um, other little take with Zach Maybe Taylor's that's game day. Maybe that's game day. Game day khakis. That's true. Tiger Woods Sunday. Red. He's got the Michigan Navy on. I, I think in general, the big guys want to stand and the little guys want to sit down. <laughs> that's the only, like in general, that I could say. Right yeah. in general, you don't have a lot of uh, uh, giants. Brian Dable's the only quote little guy. He's thick but he's yeah. the only short guy that's standing dan quinn's a lot shorter than i thought he was gerard mayo is a lot bigger than i remember him. right <laughs> he's got a few extra lbs on it's hard dan, to find hard to find zach taylor between uh zach Gerard taylor mayo. zach taylor's a lot taller and bigger than i thought he was dan quinn obviously we know he's a monster um anyways um interesting uh little photos here uh but so the head coaches get all the stardom. The poor GMs have a photo, but it doesn't really get talked yeah. about, which is I, interesting. I photo, it looked yeah. more sparsely attended. Yeah. yeah, but where's you know where's the the GM photo uh, critique uh, going on here? But you know if you look at the shorter coaches, they're all sitting down, right? I mean, I think most of the shorter coaches yeah, are the all GM sitting. photo. There's about um, almost 10, 10 plus people visiting. Well, their excuse there is here. I'm busy talking <laughs> business, <laughs> yeah. right? Whereas the coaches, they're not necessarily yeah. involved in the trades and they're not there coaching, uh, et cetera. But anyways, all right, enough silliness time. Big, big, to... I'm sure Big Cats is much better than what we just did. So go watch it. <laughs> Ours is off the cuff on the fly. Yeah. So. I... Talk just to add that came out right now. Um, Miami has um, rumored to extend an offer to your pen pal, um, Ono Beckham. That would be interesting. Yeah, do you guys like that or? Oh, I mean, he's at a point in his career. My Baltimore, I don't know if he that was a run heavy offense. I don't know if he was able to shine. He did miss our prop barely, so but he can yep. get a third guy and not be relied on and still be okay. He right? still got some in the tank. Yeah. So, what do you think of? Uh, we were talking, to my boy Jim. Yeah, love Jim. Uh, what do you think about him going to the Michigan Pro Day? I think he's like a number one cheerleader. <laughs> I think like I feel he, he, he loves JJ. Him. He should be the Chargers number one cheerleader right now, but he's still like a tie hard for a little Ah, but maybe he is. Yeah. Jim's Jim's crafty, yeah. crafty smart. Think about this. No one's gonna think poorly of him. He's coming back to Michigan to see his boys. Yeah. And there are other people to see too, so right. why not? Maybe he's got to move some things from his house and it's a paid for trip. I don't know. It's a chance <laughs> for to see some people. And he's showing love to JJ McCarthy. And who would say anything? There's anything wrong with that, right? Or is he setting up the Chargers for success? The Chargers are at number five and don't need a quarterback. If he keeps promoting, there are four top quarterbacks, with J.J. McCarthy being the fourth. fourth one, yeah. The Chargers will have the number one non-quarterback <laughs> pick, either to trade down from right. for someone else who wants somebody or improves their value. Because if J.J. McCarthy was supposed to be a number 12, but he somehow jumps to number four, you're increasing the value. And even if McCarthy isn't taking it four, maybe someone wants to go to five to get him. Right. So there is some method to the professor's madness, I <laughs> think. As people say, it's lying season. It's whatever. Yeah. And look, there's always messages behind what coaches say. And I know Jim well enough. He's a very smart guy. Like his Keenan Allen quote. Who's got it better than him? $23 yeah, million on, dollars the yeah, in, on, the on the Bears and wide receiver. That's a nice comment. Translation, yeah, we have cap issues and we couldn't <laughs> We didn't <laughs> think you were worth that. <laughs> so good for you. Go go get your money and, right. and what have you. So I'm not sure that what, besides being a good guy and saying J.J. McCarthy is good, but I think it helps the Chargers as well. Yeah, I would say he's the lead proponent of the four QB multiple, draft uh, with four <laughs> McCarthy. And if that happens, that makes the fifth pit more valuable. And even if one drops out of the four, it still makes now number five valuable because everyone knows the Chargers aren't going to draft a quarterback. They need a wide receiver now. Or, the next guy. or conspiracy theory. They're going to trade Justin Herbert and draft J.J. McCarthy. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. That's not going to happen. That's not happening. 
that'd be uh, that'd be there, quite the news. Also, another reason a lot of mock drafts that uh, um, we have a big thing about Blake Corum, remember his ACL tear right. a couple years ago. He is rumored to maybe be mock drafted to the Chargers. Not at number five. five. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a pick. <laughs> as a pick. Yeah, okay. I, I could. Yeah. Well, I will say this about Jim. He's loyal to his guys. Yeah. And that's not a bad trait. Right? Right. I'm just saying he's loyal to his guys. Right. So it, I could totally, totally see that. I see some of the other NFL news coming out, like um, uh, Joe Burrow's on track, which right. we always felt. Anthony Richardson on track, which we always felt. What other news? Kurt Cousins last week. Kurt Cousins, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the, some overall good news happening there in the NFL. Uh, we want to start the season with yeah. everybody healthy. Jimmy G uh, confirmed our your earlier analysis of the uh, was it therapeutic therapeutic use exempt exemption T U E yeah. therapeutic use exemption. There are a number of medications that are legal if you file for the right to use it. Uh, and there's a number of medications that if you don't, it's illegal to use. I'm not saying that he used Adderall, but Adderall is one of those. Mm -hmm. And the, the therapeutic use exemption for Adderall is one of the harder ones to get. But the way that he was fined and whatever, I mean, they've known about this for a long time because yeah. you have the appeal process right. and the whole deal. And he ran out of exhausted revenues he got four million i think from the rams yeah but he had, but he was owed 11 something from the raiders yeah so he lost a net seven in that deal yeah. that's why russell wilson is so cheap veteran minimum because he's getting 38 from yeah. denver offset of 1.3 now right. but still he's still getting his net 38 but yeah therapeutic use exemption and i heard after i did my TUE Jimmy G because I said you know you're supposed to just ask the athletic trainers uh, or the doctors and whatever right. and there was some conspiracy theory that they sold him out to save the Raiders money <laughs> no possible way first of all when the violation happened it was early season right. when they still Jimmy thought G he was, was the guy, their guy yeah. so yeah. why would you do that B there's no way any athletic trainer or doctor would do that. So they don't get order. approached by the front office saying, Hey, could you do this to solid? <laughs> I would be shocked if someone were asked and even more shocked if someone agreed right. to do it. Right. I mean, that's just so against this, that, the other. And to me, if you don't have your reputation in the locker room and the training room, You've got nothing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to to do that would be. And look, if that was done to them, why wouldn't Jimmy G and Don Yee's agent be screaming from the mountaintops? Yeah. He asked a team person right. and he got sold down the river. Yeah. Are we right? I mean, you'd be screaming. So no possible way that that happens in my mind. He either overlooked it or... The TUE thought the TUE would come through on Adderall or whatever it was, and it didn't. And uh, look, there's a lot of things on the list that are interesting. I mean, caffeine is a bad substance, but you couldn't really drink enough coffee to get there, yeah. right? You'd have to be doing... Not even Dan Campbell? He gets there. He gets close. Not, not close. <laughs> well, there are no TUEs for coaches, <laughs> and there are no drug testing for coaches. Yeah. Really? No. <laughs> There's no drug testing for That's coaches. They brought up, remember when Adam Gase had his little eye thing? They brought that up too. I remember because they said there's no drug testing. There's no drug testing for coaches. But yeah, I don't know. With all that, all that caffeine he drinks, he might get close. He might get close. I don't know. <laughs> Just want to mention uh, NBA coverage continuing. Obviously, we'll have uh, baseball, some fantasy baseball articles up at the website, sixscore.com. College basketball continuing throughout the uh, Sweet 16 and Elite Eight. Uh, any parting thoughts, Doc? Any who's your beast of the NFL coaches photo? Who chose the right seating arrangement? Maybe let's see who's the beach beast of the NFL coaching photo. I think that was Mike McDaniel's idea. Hey, Mike McDonald, you want to sit next to each other? This will be funny. Just confuse everybody. I don't know if anyone's getting confused. 
I mean, Mike McDaniel, you would you wouldn't expect anything less, but the South Beach rolled up pants and and what have <laughs> you. That, yeah. That's true. Pretty clean cut versus Mike McDaniel. So, uh, you know, you know, Jim Harbaugh sitting front and middle. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, he gets command. front and middle. He got front and middle, uh, <laughs> kind of thing. I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm a little partial to uh, to uh, Kevin O'Connell. Okay, admittedly, San Diego State guy. I know Kevin a little <laughs> bit. Look at him. He looks pretty big and imposing, and it looks like he's flexing his chest out, and he doesn't look like a quarterback there. Yeah. I mean, he looks taller than Dan Campbell. Maybe not quite as big, but – well, he's, that's the most space in between two yeah he's got the most space there he's yeah, he's flexing it up. He looks so, relaxed yeah uh, and it's a nice little photo of him he's casual he's not over the top and I, I i'd say kevin o'connell is the beast of the beast in that photo there i that's you that or jim harbaugh who sat front center in the middle i mean that's the super coach. He's right there. yeah division rival yeah all right. Thanks for watching uh, Sports Injury Central Pro Football Doc Podcast. Thank you to Mr. David slash Dave Stewart. And uh, thanks for watching, listening. Uh, please give us a nice little five-star review and check out the March Madness info. It's been profitable. Thanks for watching.